Hello, everyone. Uh, we'd like to thank you and wel welcome you to the Seedlings program tonight. My name is Amy Fontaine, and I am the library supervisor of the Rochambeau Library at the Providence Community Library System. My colleagues and the co-organizers of the Seedlings are here as well. Lee Smith is running the tech behind the scenes tonight, adult si services librarian at PCL's Mount Pleasant Library and Fatima Masood, an ecological landscape designer, educator, and artist who just finished up their year-long art residency with the City of Providence's Office of Sustainability. Additionally, we would like to thank our collaborators on this project, Vanessa Venturini and the URI Master Gardeners, and also Summer Brown of the Brown University Super Fund. This is a partnership that we are really excited about. Um, so we're also really excited about tonight's presentation understanding site risks for gardening at, with Ann Carroll and Jessica Dominguez of the Environmental Protection Agency. And I realized I just had Summer's name wrong. I used Brown twice, so it's Summer Gonzalez. Gonzalez. So, so sorry about that. All right, so Ann is currently with EPA's Office of Brownfields and Land Revitalization in the Washington, D.C. office as a public health program and urban agricultural lead and has over 30 years experience on lead poisoning prevention, contaminated site identification and cleanup, and risk communication to support local revitalization and safe re reuse. Jessica is the Region 1 Land Revitalization Coordinator and has served for over 13 years as a project officer in the EPA Region 1 Brownfields Program. In that time, Jessica has maintained oversight of over 400 projects under more than 60 different grant and technical assistance awards. Uh, so we are so happy to have them here. Um, our presenters will happily take questions after the presentation, but please feel free to type your questions as they arise in the chat throughout the program, and there will be time at the end for answers. Uh, closed captioning is available if you click the button at the bottom of your Zoom window. And now I'm going to turn it over to Fatima to say a few words about the Seed Library. I'm just going to take five minutes of your time to introduce the Seed Library very quickly. And if you have any questions about it, feel free to either reach out directly to me or drop them in the chat and I'll do my best to respond. So the Providence Seed Library is a free community resource. It's available, it's a partnership with Providence Community Libraries. And um, for the past year, we've been able to distribute open pollinated heirloom and culturally relevant seeds. So that means seeds that you can save from one generation to the next, seeds that are attached to um, narratives or particular narratives and seeds that are relevant to some of the different communities that call Providence home. Um, so you can take seeds out of the library for free and you can donate or return seeds to the library and it's sustained through those donations. And you can find the seeds that are available in the catalog at provseedlib.com and you can also follow the Instagram, which is at provseedlib, which I try to update, but I'm not great at. Um, so if you were to go to the website, this is how you could access and navigate the catalog. You would first, um, you'd click on the link to the Seed Library catalog, and from there it would take you to the Ocean State Libraries catalog. So the amazing librarians at Providence Community Libraries have created this really cool way to access seeds like their books that you'd borrow from the library. So the first page you'd go to is on the left of the screen, and that has broad categories of plants. Let's say you wanted to take out some beans from the library, you would click on that subcategory and it would take you to the next page, which is on the right of my screen and maybe yours. Um, and there you can see what seeds are available. You can see what library branch they're at and you can either put a hold on them online like you would with the book or you can physically go to the library branch and scope out what's available. Um, this is information you find it's would be the common name, the botanical name, um, where it's sourced from, and the um, seed growing difficulty. I got a little notice that my internet connection is unstable. Can people hear me? Cool, just making sure. And then these are some guidelines for donating seeds. So right now is a great time to donate seeds to the library because we're kind of getting ready for the new growing season. So if you have some things um, to offer, please do so. So you can always, um, let's say you purchase seeds and you didn't use the entire packet and they 
follow our guidelines, you can always donate those to the library. And what I'm sharing with you now is guidelines for if you're um, bringing in seeds from your own garden or farm. So first, um, bring your seeds in a sealed paper envelope to a Providence Community Library branch, and I'll share the participating branches in a moment. And please label it with as much of the following information as you can. So first, label it with the common name. So this might be the name that's on a packet when you buy the seed, like painted pony bean, or it could be the name that you use culturally. So one example of this that I included here is Sempasuchil, which is an indigenous name for a plant that is also known as marigold. So um, for me, if I know the indigenous name or different ways that a plant is known, I think it's really important and really powerful to include that. So if you know it, please add it. Um, a kind of cute story is that I included Bengali names of some plants and one of my aunts was like, how did they know? And I was like, I, I wrote that and she was proud of me. Um, that's the whole story. So another thing, this next one is a little to some people, but if you can name the scientific name, that would make me really happy. I know that for me sometimes if you can look at it, you can add it. I think it's super but the scientific and um, meaning like the Latin names the plants have also has a really colonial history. So I get that people don't love it, but please add it if you can. Um, if you're interested in kind of staying connected to the seeds that you're donating to the library, you can include contact info or an email address, but that's completely optional. Um, and it would be super helpful if you can include where you grew the plant, the year you grew it, and if possible, how many um, plants you're collecting seed from. So that might mean like seeds from one sunflower head, or it might mean seeds from 20 to 30 okra pods. It's not essential, but if someone is like getting really... Um, if someone is getting really technical with their seed saving, sometimes that is valuable information to know about the genetic diversity of the plants you're working with. Um, and it would be really helpful if you also added if it's an annual, meaning you have to plant it from seed every year, or if it's a perennial, so something that can um, regrow from roots year after year. Um, these next, so these are, this is a longer conversation on the like what guidelines to be mindful of in returning seeds to the library. Um, I have a couple things that I've included here, but, um, and I can explain them if you have questions about them. So feel free to ask in the chat. But if you're donating seeds, I ask that you don't donate hybrid seeds. So on the packet, they would be labeled hybrid or F1 um, or seeds that are saved like the next generation or F2 generation saved from hybrid plants. So that's like, let's say you grew some sun gold tomatoes that you really loved and you saved seeds from them. Um, someone else growing with those seeds won't get consistent traits in their plants. Um, but hybrids are not bad. Humans have been hybridizing plants for as long as we've been in relationship with plants. So it is not an unnatural process. Um, this is a little less common to come by as a casual or home gardener, but um, please don't donate patented or genetically modified seed. I think it's worth noting that. And this last point is a little more relevant in the summer, but please try not to donate seed that you haven't dried or seed that is moldy to the seed library. And the participating branches are Knight Memorial Library, Mount Pleasant, Washington Park, and Rochambeau. And that's a growing list. Um, I also think if you dropped off seeds at any Providence Community Library branch, they would make it to one of the participating branches because um, there's always interlibrary exchange happening. And I'm going to skip over seed borrowing guidelines for the moment, but you'll have these slides sent to you. And if you have any questions, you can ask me today. You can email me at hello at propseedlib.com. You can check out the catalog at propseedlib.com, and you can follow the Instagram at propseedlib. Thank you for your time, and I hope you enjoy the presentation. Amy, I think you're on mute. Oh, no. Can you not hear me? 
Now we can. Now we can. Now you can. Okay, so I'll just, I'll just say a question came into the chat about um, recommended method for drying seed, and we do have a handout at the four participating libraries uh, on how to dry your seeds, and that's both in English and Spanish. So we can certainly email that out to people if they want it, or you could stop into one of the libraries, which is better, and then you can see what seeds we have. Um, but I just want to say thank you so much, Fatima. Your information is always so wonderful. Um, and now we're ready to turn it over to Anne and Jessica and to learn about our soil. So take it away, ladies. Thank you so much and Happy New Year, everybody. Um, I'm very excited that you invited um, myself and, and Jessica to talk to you today. Um, Jessica's running our, our slides, which I think we'll, we'll all be happier about. Um, and now I'm just really sad I'm not in Providence to uh, go check things out of the seed library. So thank you for that, Fatima. Um, I'm, I now have to figure out if Virginia has something similar uh, where I live. Um, so we are here to talk to you about soil. And so we have a little bit of a presentation, as you heard. I'm with the EPA's Office of Brownfields and Land Revitalization in Washington, D.C. Next slide, please. Um, and so what we want to do is really set the stage, um, uh, tell you a little bit about brownfields and land revitalization and our work with soils and urban ag, um, point you to some resources we have at the very end, um, talk to you about our, our experience, which is finding and fixing with communities contaminated sites, including the sites that everybody is afraid are contaminated, but lo and behold, when you actually do some investigation, they're not so bad. Um, and then Jess is going to um, give you the bulk of our presentation based on her experience and, and some really practical advice for New England and the kinds of sites she's been working with for a number of years. Um, and then, um, you know, we'll share some more information, technical resources, some other um, entities that we work with and partner with. And of course, questions and answers. We really want to hear from you. Um, so if you have questions as you're going, please put them in the chat. Um, but I don't think we'll be opening mics for all of you. Um, we'll, we'll hold that for the moment. So next slide, please. So I, I, I know this is not new to any of you, but urban agriculture isn't new. Um, and actually most of the world is practicing urban agriculture. Um, except in the United States, we now just know that we have environmental and public health laws. And so a, we're a little less willing to conduct urban agriculture, and we are mindful that there might be some new things that we have to consider. Um, at least in, in our work, and you know, we recognize we're biased towards contaminated sites, but we recognize that there are several centuries of industry, manufacturing, commercial, power generating, and just waste handling, and you know, our, our practices that have created soil hazards. Um, some soil hazards do occur naturally, but many of the ones we're obviously trying to deal with are the man-made um, soil hazards. And so the good news is brownfields and contaminated site experts who have this experience um, can help um, and they want to help. Um, and we, on the other hand, are so excited to be working with soil scientists and plant health experts because marrying our knowledge is what we want to be doing to help make sure communities are finding safe sites to grow, or if it's not safe, that we can turn it into a safe site with them. And also that we'll be picking good sites for the plants and doing what we can to improve soil health. So we know now what we didn't used to know, and we also need, know we need to work better with soil and plant health experts and look forward to doing that. So a brown field by law is a real property, the expansion, redevelopment, and reuse of which may be complicated by the presence or potential presence of a hazardous substance, gluten, and contaminant. And that's some legal words, but the key thing that I always focus on is the potential presence because turns out from our examination of our data, roughly 30% of the projects that we encounter actually don't have contamination above a level that requires cleanup. So there might be some contamination because we're getting better and better at detecting it, but sometimes it's not at a level that's going to pose a risk. And so the good news is don't be afraid 
to ask those questions and don't be afraid to talk to the experts. Next slide, please. So just generally, you know, here are some examples of brownfields. It's not exhaustive, but it's really to make you think about your neighborhood, the areas that you wanna grow, um, the areas where there's opportunities because there might be vacant land. And sometimes it's because there's a, you know, an old railroad spur near a former manufacturing or, or port facility area. Sometimes it's because there's illegal dumping and there's a problem there. Um, but those are just a host of different kinds of reuses that we have found associated with sites that need cleanup. Next slide, please. Contamination can be obvious or can be subtle. Um, and so I think that's, you know, that's where the experience of, of the brownfields and other contaminated site lands, as well as, you know, you have your own local experts with Brown Superfund Technical Resource Center, as well as I know there have been, um, there are other experts available to you in the region that can talk through these issues with you on the brownfield side. So, you know, we obviously have the very, you know, readily accessible and understandable contaminated site. And then those that, you know, probably if we, we got a more granular picture of that site, it might be become clear that there's some, some other materials that would suggest it was contamination or there was illegal dumping or there's some soil staining or some other things that would say, hmm, we need to sample this and look into this a little bit more. Next slide, please. So um, in the Brownfields program, it was one of those, you know, ecological experiments in 2008. Oh, back there you go. Thanks. Um, in 2008, as the fuel prices went up, food prices spiked. And so then suddenly everybody and their brother and sister wanted to find a vacant lot and start a garden, um, which you understand food prices were going crazy. But my hair on fire moment as an environmental professional and public health professional is just because it's vacant doesn't mean it's safe. Um, and having worked on lead poisoning prevention for, you know, 30 plus years, um, I knew that there were issues in urban soils that people weren't always aware of. Um, the good news is the Brownfields program nationally, as well as our state and tribal programs, were really excited because our expertise could be put to such an important use. And so we, um, we collectively um, jumped into where we could work with communities that wanted to start community gardens, urban farms, and really look at the soils and urban ag. Um, we also funded a, a research project with Kansas State University for them to, as the soil and agronomy department, who also had environmental chemistry folks, um, conduct the research and look at turning uh, brownfields into community gardens, but also look at both the exposure of those who are growing in the garden, any kind of um, uptake of contaminants by the plants, and also some uh, tests of the soils as the growing seasons continued. Um, we also hosted a webinar series just to find out what was the status of practice in urban agriculture. And we created Brownfields and Urban Agriculture Interim Guard Guidelines because EPA had nothing at the time. Um, next slide, please. We also looked at the internal data of the Brownfields program. So looking at all of the cleanup sites um, that, so that's essentially a community that has applied for a Brownfield grant and used that money to clean up a site and then reported back to EPA what they found. And so of that group, um, and that was 1,400 sites. These were the kinds of contaminants that were reported back. So, you know, there might be people that are doing cleanup right now that haven't reported in this time frame that isn't reflected here. But not surprisingly, lead was the most commonly reported, as well as petroleum, which kind of makes sense. We do a lot of abandoned gas stations and fuel depots. Asbestos, we don't talk as much about that in urban agriculture and community gardens. PAHs or polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons and the other metals, volatile solvents, PCBs, and both naturally occurring and, and consumer product related arsenic. So that's only part of the periodic table, but those are the, some of the things that we want people to be at least aware could be an issue um, and hopefully help them over that, those contamination um, issues. Next slide, please. So. 
We have recently published a, um, if you go and check out the Brown Builds and Urban Ag Interim Guidelines, uh, you will discover that was a little bit of a practitioner guide. And so we're hoping this is a much more visually attractive and stepwise approach that anybody who, they don't have to have brownfield knowledge or expertise to understand how you have to think about and know before you grow. Next slide, please. So, um, and that's the link on the website. Um, and essentially it, it really is taking that vacant lot, um, that abandoned area and looking at different parts of the property um, and what are the kind of steps that you'll have to do to turn it into a, a garden. But we don't want any community-based organization to be dealing like they have to do. They don't have to become Brownfields experts. We have Brownfields experts um, and we are, um, happy and um, interested in helping um, any community-based organization to kind of go through these steps and get the right environmental professionals to help them. Um, so this really just goes through some of the steps that any organization needs to be thinking about. And I think for those of you who are both growers at community gardens, school gardens, and other settings, as well as your own backyards, you might find you're already doing some of these things and hopefully There'll also be other things that it helps you think about. Next slide, please. We have just um, received our Spanish translation version. This is not yet posted on the EPA website. So hope to get that up um, on the next couple of days. And I'm um, excited to have that. And of course, if there are other languages, um, we have some of our materials in other languages. Um, talk to Jess. Um, we'll see if we can, if that would be more helpful to have it in other languages. Um, we can certainly look into that. Next slide, please. So um, Kansas State University, as I mentioned, did a research project um, a couple of years ago. And so essentially it was taking um, brownfields or suspected brownfields and um, in this case, this is a, a residential site between two homes. You can't see it. The home that was there uh, was torn down. And, um, and both the neighbors really were interested in having a community garden on this vacant lot. And so uh, Kansas State University approached the um, community, got permission to access the site and put in um, essentially test plots and a community garden. And so what you see there is they're doing some soil testing with an x-ray fluorescence analyzer. Um, and they wanted to screen the site um, every uh, six meters or so just to look at the trace elements. Um, there was some moderately elevated lead. Um, there also was a little bit of arsenic. And they also tested for chloridane, um, something we don't hear about much. Um, it's no longer on the market, but it was a, um, a persistent pesticide that was actually used as a termiticide in this area. And so that's the other thing we sometimes forget when we have wood frame homes. We have injected a number of different things around the foundations of homes to protect the homes against pests over years. And that might not be in common knowledge. On the other hand, it was a practice that might have left some kind of legacy contamination. So that's why they tested for it. And they did find a little. Next slide, please. And so we just wanted to show this um, one. So you get a sense of this was a, a residential lot in Kansas City. And we can talk about how much that might reflect the reality in, in Providence. But the point is um, there was a variation across the site. And so if, if we were planning a garden there, I think all of us would immediately say, okay, let's go for the light area, yellow areas. But what do we do in the other areas where there are higher levels um, and how are we going to manage that soil? So I think at this point, I probably want to turn the microphone over to Jess and she will lead you through the rest of our presentation. Am I right? I believe so. I'm going to go to the next slide, I think. Good slide changing. Thank you. <laughs> First, now it's not going ahead. Oh, there it is. Okay, thank you, Anne. Um, so Anne is the person I turn to and learn from in all things urban ag. 
Um, she is in the EPA headquarters in Washington, DC, and really helps all of us across the country do our job better on this subject. Uh, I work here um, in New England, uh, based out of our Boston headquarters, uh, but really work in all six New England states and even lived in Rhode Island for a while. Um, so I'm really happy to be talking to you guys tonight. Um, so in EPA Region 1, when we work on urban ag, it's really with a lot of focus on lead in soil, and there are a few reasons for that. Um, lead is uh, a pervasive contaminant, as Anne mentioned, it is often found at, at our brownfield sites. It's naturally a prevalent element. Um, it is found in higher levels often from human activities. Um, including a range of things from um, past use of lead gasoline, some types of industrial facilities, lead in, paint in homes is probably one of the most common things people think of. Um, and depending on the history of the property, lead is something that is uh, more easily measurable and can be an e uh, indicator of other soil contaminants as well. Um, and just an indicator that soil should be something that you are aware of and careful of in your gardening and interaction with it. Um, so could there be higher levels of soil reductor? What are you thinking that soil in gardens, yards, and playgrounds can become contaminated, uh, especially um, when you're thinking about exterior lead paint from houses, that drip line, uh, when the um, building slate peels uh, can often get into the soil um, around a building. Uh, soil may also be contaminated from past use, lead gasoline, and people fixing cars in their driveways, um, or on um, larger scale nearby industrial activities as well. So one of the things um, that we've uh, done in Region 1 is uh, started up what's called the Soil Shop Team and working with our partners um, in the Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry, or ATSDR, uh, which is a really great um, human health uh, and risk assessment uh, agency that the EPA often works with. Um, the primary purpose of a soil shop is health education. We want people to make better informed decisions and protect their health. Um, but at the same time, have really um, be empowered to have the productive gardens and yard space that they want to have. Um, so at soil shop events, uh, people receive free soil screening for lead. Um, it's amazing. People can even get excited about soil screening when you say it's free. Um, and provide information on safe gardening practices, good gardening practices. Um, we often partner with local garden clubs and things to help provide that information and seeds and things like that. Uh, ways to protect children from lead exposure. Um, I know I garden with my own kids a lot, and a lot of people, that is something that one of the, the goals of community or home garden is to connect youth to fresh local food. Um, and then one-on-one -on -one site informed health education. Once you go to get those screening results to give personalized uh, advice on best practices and approaches and, and what can be done um, with a relative level of risk that that screening shows for a site. Um, now, this is something that, um, you know, this is the, the high intensity event that we're able to do with lead communication each year. Um, so we're really only able to typically do one, one or two a year, and this is just kind of a list of some of the more recent ones that we've done, and we did do one in Providence back in 2018, and these are some of the pictures from that event. Um, it, was, it was a really uh, great day and turnout, and uh, really enjoyed the time. And we partnered with the Southside Community Land Trust, uh, the Childhood Led Action Project, and Groundworks in the City of Providence, and uh, you know, that's one of the key things. We don't do this on our own. Um, you know, we would love to partner with people who, who want to get the word out for, for safer gardening and soil. So kind of the key messages uh, when we talk about uh, urban agriculture and lead and soil shops is really is there's no safe lead lead level for soil. Um, and But uh, lead poisoning is a preventable disease. Because uh, we're really concerned about what are we would term as sensitive populations, meaning that they're more likely to be affected by exposure to lead than other people in the population. That is really children, uh, women of childbearing age, and we want to get that information uh, to those people in particular. Um, so we also share information on how to get kids uh, tested um, for blood blood levels. Um, and then how to identify, control, and safely or safely remove if you need to lead hazards in their environment. Um, you know, 
some of the information I just covered on why lead is commonly found in urban soils and um, you know, how to avoid exposure to lead and other contaminants often um, in soil with lead uh, in urban environments. The other thing we talk about are exposure pathways. Um, you know, with, you, with some of the other lead programs, you know, you're thinking about dust in homes and kids eating lead paint chips and things like that. And the soil can be a little different. It can be a direct soil to human exposure pathway. Um, it's the greatest risk is from, you know, contaminated soil getting into your mouth or by breathing in the dust uh, when you're outside. Uh, you remember soil can also be tracked back into the house and then you might get a kid or something, you know, crawling on the floor and putting their hands in their mouth. Um, there's also soil to plant to human <laughs> exposure pathways. Um, some edible plants do take up and accumulate contaminants. Uh, it depends on a lot of factors. Lead uptake is rare, but it does happen in certain uh, environments. Um, but it also can be ingested just from where it remains on the surface of plants. Um, you know, it's really hard, you know, to wash kind of really you know, intricate leafy greens or root vegetables. Um, you know, you're always going to have a little bit of contamination on the surface. Um, and so there's ways and best practices on, on what to do with different types of fruits and vegetables that you're growing to minimize exposure risk. So general best practices, uh, you want to reduce exposure to lead. Um, after playing, working outdoors is a really easy one. Leave your shoes at the door or on doormats. Wash your hands as soon as you come in. Don't bring what's outside in your house with you. Um, keep kids and pets from playing in soil, especially closer to a home or garage or driveway. Um, that might um, have some spill or past exposure or uh, dripping of lead. Um, plant bushes there, spread stone or mulch, really discourage even incidental um, exposure to that type of soil in higher risk areas. Um, one of the things, and I'm gonna repeat this again later, there is no such thing as free soil. Uh, we've had people be really diligent and clean up a site and then accept soil that's even dirtier than the ones was there to begin with. You want to get your soil if you're bringing in clean fill or soil for uh, garden beds or raised beds or container gardening, that it is from a reputable source and that it is clean. Um, you know, and don't be afraid to ask questions. Environmental, agriculture, public health, all these very similar languages. If you're ever concerned, confused, you want to know what certain things mean for your particular uh, situation, don't hesitate to reach out to the EPA or your local health organization to get more information on what things mean to you. Um, gardening uh, best practices. Again, um, especially urban areas. And when I say urban, it can also be industrial heritage areas. It doesn't have to be kind of a traditional um, downtown densely populated areas can be also areas near landfills and power plants and, um, you know, things like that. You know, so, you know, one of the best things you can do is build a raised bed or protect, practice containing gardening. Um, just don't go in the soil if you're not able to test or mediate uh, or save the garden based on, on the results that you get. Um, you can use soil amendments to stabilize contaminants uh, in soil or replace current soil, again, with clean soil. Um, you know, again, make sure the amendments or replacement soil is from a clean source. Um, plant uptake is primarily an issue for root crops, but it can be managed. Um, for beets, carrots, carrots, radish, things like that, maintaining a neutral pH and increasing organic materials can reduce the risk of uptake. Um, again, while working in the garden harvesting, wear gloves and closed-toed shoes. I know I also often run out with my flip-flops in the summertime, not the best thing to do. Um, root and leafy, leafy green vegetables may be more likely to accumulate lead on their surface. Do you really want to thoroughly wash or peel uh, those types of vegetables before eating it? And then after working in your garden, again, like I said before, remove shoes and gloves before walking indoors and thoroughly wash your hands. Um, you, you know, I, I know dust always gets through my gardening gloves to my fingertips um, uh, before touching or eating or doing anything else indoors. So quiz time, and I know we can't really interact, but I'm going to go through the quiz and, and kind of give you the scenarios. And I want just to help you kind of think through the different things you might be doing in your own garden um, come spring, summer, and fall of uh, this coming year. So kind of based on what we uh, just talked about, 
you know, growing things uh, in the ground, um, keeping in mind that there are plants uh, that may absorb lead. And again, this is not, um, there isn't a, this is kind of a, a general rule of thumb guidance. Um, this is from the ATSDR soil shop toolbox, but there is some debate back and forth about how common some of these are. But plants like leafy greens, maybe some herbs and definitely root vegetables may absorb lead in certain soil circumstances. And then things like fruiting plants uh, do not commonly. So in a situation where you're growing something around like carrots, you know, what do you want to do? What do you need to think about? Uh, first off, as I said, the pH of the soil. Um, a neutral pH, loss of organic matter, will make it much less likely that um, there's going to be uptake of lead or uh, other contaminants into those carrots. Um, also, root vegetable. Any, um, you know, you want to be peeling, washing, peeling root vegetables before you eat them. It is nearly impossible to get everything off the surface um, of a vegetable. Now, again, this is all about relative risk. This is assuming that you've screened your soil, uh, that you've done some sampling, and um, that it is still, it is low enough risk to uh, garden in and not too high that you should be doing container or um, raised beds. The next quiz, growing greens. Um, you know, Again, looking, thinking about how, you know, just look at the structure of those leaves, where they grow in the soil, the splash up from when it rains or when you water, you're going to get a lot of soil kind of into the intricate uh, folds and things of that, this type of vegetable. You really want um, to thoroughly wash, thoroughly wash greens uh, and things before you eat them. And then, you know, even on, um, you know, moderately low contaminated risk sites, you might, you want to consider having your greens and herbs and things grown in container and uh, raised bed type garden situations. And then I love to throw in the tomatillos and husk cherries because uh, they're fruiting plants, right? Lowest risk, and they come in their own little wrapper you can take off. Yes, you still need to wash them. Um, you know, just because it is low risk um, that you are getting any uptake of contaminants into those fruits, you still need to wash them thoroughly uh, before eating them, even if they come in their own little natural wrappers. Um, and then, uh, you know, in these lower risk situations, you're growing things that are really low risk. You have a low risk uh, type site, but you're in an urban area. You could have depositions of soil you could have blow off from neighboring homes and things like that. Think about the pathways in your garden. Think about mulch and stone and, you know, what kind of exposure you could get just walking around and through um, your garden area and what you, how you can minimize getting things onto you, breathing them into your, breathing anything into your lungs or tracking it back into your house. So you're in a situation, uh, you have a site and you wanna establish a garden. Um, first and foremost, we recommend testing your soil. Um, you know, something that gardeners often do um, for the health of their plants, but test also for the health of the people tending the garden and eventually eating anything that you're growing. Um, and then, you know, when you're too afraid to grow on the ground and haven't tested yet or aren't able to, I know a lot of labs um, during COVID were actually shut down. People couldn't get screened for a while. Um, you don't wanna, you wanna ask yourself the, you know, what are you risking in, in still using a site? Um, you know, are you attracting families and folks to an unsafe site? Um, are you, you know, or other ways that you can make it safer for them before doing so. Um, if you're planning raised beds, you know, are the play areas where you're going to, if there are kids coming, where are they going to go? Um, again, those walkways, the heavy mulching, things like that can help create safer areas around a garden uh, for families and whole communities to participate and enjoy a site. Um, how are we sourcing the clean, safe soils, you know, and just, you know, what liability are you taking on? And there's lots of information we can share um, both on the federal and state level to help me make those informed decisions. Uh, in sports or pain, there's no such thing as free soil. I mean, you can't say that enough. It's because it's broken my heart too many times working with people. Um, you want to establish clear and accessible best gardening practices for yourself and anyone else who might be using the garden. Um, and that's something that can be passed on. So hopefully, you know, you're establishing gardens or, or, or having a, a garden at a home. Um, there's going to be future owners or future users, something that you can hand on to them so they can also continue to have um, best practices uh, on how to safely engage with the site. 
um, maintain and share your sampling history and protective measures that are in place so they don't get compromised by their future users who might not like mulch and want to pull it out. They want to know, you want to make sure everyone knows why it's there, take photos um, and, and make sure that the, the work you put in gets passed on and protectiveness as well. And so, you know, this most of these advice is for kind of moderately and, and, and lightly contaminated, you know, sites with light, moderate contamination concerns. Uh, but those properties that might have a greater contamination that you can take on in your own, you know, this is when you might want to be thinking about the Brownfields program and what Anne had kind of um, outlined before. And this is where I also work here in Region One in New England. Um, there are a slew of different types of entities that are eligible for our funding in different ways we can even help with partnerships with organizations that that might be eligible if you are not as an individual um, and these are just even some pictures from um, you know gardening and food based organizations and nonprofits in England that we've successfully worked with over the years um, you know, the different types of funding and, you know, again, this, this is just a range of things we can do from assessment to cleanup to just even technical assistance and site design and, and things like that. Um, so if you have an idea, you have a need, don't hesitate to reach out to me and we can try and troubleshoot something. Um, you know, this is a slide um, that Anna, I'm going to quickly go through it. When we're talking about the Brownfields program on a national level, it, it really is a fantastic program. There's so many benefits, um, environmental, social, and economic, that comes from helping better define um, blighted and potentially contaminated sites, reducing risk of exposure to surrounding communities, and bringing them back in productive reuse in partnership with the local community. Um, when it comes down to, we also really want to see further benefits through things in-house sites are reused like through urban agriculture um, in those ways that we work like why we're giving this presentation today because uh, there's so many benefits to urban agriculture we don't want people um, to do it unsafely first and foremost but we also don't want people to be scared away from doing it at all um, urban agriculture agriculture in areas with an industrial legacy like rhode island where the industrial revolution started um, is still worth it it's really important Local food is important. It minimizes costs and maximizes food safety when done right with some of the guidelines we shared with you today. Uh, provides use for vacant lands. So many increased social benefits to having locally grown and controlled food and minimizes environmental impacts um, on the foods of the food system for our community. Um, so with that, I'm gonna invite Anne back on with me. Okay, yeah, and uh, this is our contact information. Um, please don't hesitate to reach out uh, to either of us if there are, uh, are questions and things after this. Hopefully there's some good questions also that we can help answer uh, immediately. Um, but, you know, there's some good information here on uh, where to go. Uh, we're, uh, and I believe this, this slide deck will be shared with folks. Um, it, Yep, I'm getting a nod from Amy. Um, so this is uh, further information on brownfields and, brown and urban ag. This is specifically where you would go in Rhode, um, one of the, the main place to go if you're from Rhode Island for, for soil testing, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with with the UMass um, lab, and then some of our um, guidance documents, and then here information just on lead safety. We're actually, and that's another reason why lead is a major motivator of our work, especially in New England right now. Um, lead is on a natural a national focus as it should be uh, with some of the things uh, going on uh, both drinking water paint and soil and there's a draft national uh, strategy to reduce lead exposures and disparities in the United States if people really feel motivated by this and want to inform some of this national policy going on there is an open comment period on that right now and that is it all right thank you so much are you ready for questions of course. So, okay. I'm um, from Robin. Are you familiar with an old pesticide called Paris Green as a possible lead and arsenic contaminant? Yes. It okay. it is arsenic based, and I think it was also used as a coating and a pigment in things too. So mm -hmm. it it is a high arsenic level. Um, 
but I, I was not familiar with it being used in agriculture. So that I will have to do my due diligence on that one. Mm -hmm. Okay, Alicia wants to know, how can a nonprofit community garden organization work with Brownfield projects? I am well, I'll let Jess go first and then I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll pipe in. What do you wanna do? <laughs> so, <laughs> there's, there's a lot of different ways. There's a lot of different ways. So it depends, let's say. So are you looking for a site? Do you have a potential site in mind? that you want to ensure is safe? Um, are you looking to expand and, and add additional community garden sites? We could help um, help find ways to support you determine, determining what contaminants might be on site and how the best strategies for reuse of the site. If you are currently using the site, we could potentially help with some connections um, to resources to do some screening and assessment and things like that. Um, there's some nitty gritty about liability and you know who we can give funding to, but there's so many different resources. And even at the state level, um, we could try and make some connections to, um, you know, I think that the first step is just to reach out and know exactly what, what the need is and, and see if there's anything we can help with. And, and my answer is we are also not the only game in town. Yeah. Our, lo our local, you know, communities who have Brownville grants, the states, we also fund other third party entities if we are too scary to approach directly. And so they are our technical assistance providers and, you know, and they're not as scary as the EPA, although I don't think- We, try not, we try not to jump out and scare people too much, but uh, in Rhode Island, especially, uh, you know, we, we help with funding to Brownwork, uh, Brownwork Drive, Rhode Island. We have funding to uh, City of Providence. We have funding to Rhode Island DEM. Um, very, we have several different organizations already with our funding who might be able to help. Right, right. So, so there's peers already out there and they can tell you about their projects and talk you through. It's never too early to start thinking about the partnership that you want to establish, especially a community-based participatory research project. Because if you're already working with Brown or want to be or URI or other, you know, local colleges and universities, you know, well, I personally am very invested in creating the next generation of me. And so, and Jess and you. And so, you know, let's get all of those students in high school and college who want to start looking at these issues, want to start looking at this and the intersection with climate to, you know, start getting the basic science and research and public health backgrounds that will, you know, create a career and heal the soil. Great. Yeah, we, we love we love doing amplification work where we can train other people to to inform themselves and empower their own communities to make better decisions. And peer-to-peer um, -peer is another thing I should have mentioned. Um, happy to make connections to other nonprofit uh, urban ag folks that we've worked with over the years. So you guys can learn from each other. So I feel so lucky that I'm getting all these questions personally to me. So I've tried to put a few into the chat, although I, I, do, I do like yeah. that personal interaction too. So. <laughs> They're on my list, Anne. Are um, they? Okay. Actually, our next one is um, one that came into you. Uh, so it's about yard soil that was once a parking lot. So um, the question is, I've dug down and found crumbled asphalt and stones with a covering of eight to 18 inches of topsoil. Currently, I have raised beds mostly, but I have two 20 inch beds that I excavated and filled with good soil. Is it safe for edibles or how toxic do you think it is? I mean, the, the scary immediate answer is it depends. Um, and I know that's not a satisfying answer, but uh, you know, I immediately want to know, well, how long was it a parking lot? And what was it a parking lot to? And then, you know, when did it stop becoming a parking lot? And, you know, obviously you found material under the parking lot. Um, so I think, A, you know, you've taken some great steps to reduce risk and reduce exposure. Um, have you tested the soil? And where did you source, source the material that you put in? Because as Jess said, um, you know, if, if you didn't source clean material from a reputable source, then you might have, you know, 
at least not made the situation a whole lot better. I'm hoping that's not the case. Um, but, you know, that's another reason why, um, and this happened early in, if, if I might digress for a moment, um, you often see ads for clean fill. That doesn't mean safe. That means it was screened for aggregate. <laughs> <laughs> and so, as you might imagine, a soil that was screened for aggregate is probably not what you want to be using as your clean fill for your community garden. So, yeah. so you know, we're, we're not trying to give you worst case scenarios. We're, we're really telling you about what we are seeing, which is you really have to think about where you're getting any material to put in, especially a raised bed. People are afraid of the ground. And so they think, okay, well, we'll build a raised bed and, and then that'll be fine. It's like, well, what are you gonna fill the raised bed with? And what about the rest of the site that isn't the raised bed? What did you do with that? And was that safe? Because now you have created a place that people want to come to, whereas before they might have not wanted to go there. Well, I think that's part of the, the, the mulch and the rocks and the landscaping and the rose bushes. No one wants to dig through thorns, um, but you, the flowers are nice to look at. Right. Um, so I, I think that I'll, one of the things I would say, just, just in listening to this, this is kind of the, the scenario kind of hit home for me, literally. Uh, right. In my backyard, when you dig, you find what's called pig iron which is the slag from old ironworks and from a factory that used to be nearby. So someone leveled this lot nicely in the past at some point. Um, but I also brought in soil, um, a clean soil from a reputable source. Um, I add uh, organics and compost every year, but I'm also know, I measure how deep my added soil is before, and I've been adding to it and it compresses over time, but you need to know the root depths that you're dealing with and what types of crops you're dealing with. There, I only plant shallow root crops and fruiting uh, plants in my in-ground garden. And then I do extensive container gardening for root and herbs and um, you know leafy green type stuff that's away. And then I, I refill every year with fresh compost and, uh, and, uh, and soil. So well, it's, it's a little bit more in intensive but you need to know what you're, what you're dealing with because different crops have different root depths. And, uh, you know, if you, you, the best rule of thumb is if you find anything in your soil that seems like it's industrial, that it's man-made, that's potentially contained, just assume that it is until you, you're ha you have means or opportunity to test it further and just stay away, keep that away from what you're eating. Along that same line of, I'm sorry. sorry. Sorry, just a moment. Um, mm -hmm. So one thing you, uh, Rufus Cheney at USDA used to say to me was, you know, plants' roots will go where the water is and where the nutrients are. So if you end up having a, a shallower uh, watering system, mm -hmm. then you have a way of encouraging the roots to grow into the area where you have made it easier for them to grow and where the nutrients are. Mm -hmm. And so... Um, so that would be another way to, you know, when you get around to investigating or not, you know, below, you can certainly put some kind of a barrier so roots aren't going there. And you can also, you know, induce by how you add nutrients and also how you water so that you're encouraging the roots to grow in an area that is safer. Sorry to interrupt. Oh, that's that's a, no, I inter I was interrupting. I have some follow up questions along that line of thinking. So you just mentioned a barrier. What right. is there a special plastic? Someone's asking, or what kind of a barrier would you recommend? I mean, I use weed cloth, um, mm -hmm. and and you know, not I use multiple layers of weed cloth. Um, I I also get um, only the organic burlap bags from a coffee roastery near me, just so I have a visual, visual, you know, interrupter. And, and I do that. I have tested my soil, you know, but you always, you know, as you expand, you might go into an area that you haven't treated as well. And so you just want to know, here's where I've already, you know, made sure everything is safe. And then you decide when you want to expand, you go through the whole, you know, kind of improving the soil, testing the soil process. 
Um, and so that's, that's what I've done. I know that there are other kinds of materials that people use. Yeah, it's, it's the intention is to stop the roots from, from going beyond the soil you want them to stay in. Right. Okay. Several times. And, no, and knowing yourself as the grower. Oh, and I, I took care of this yeah. area. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Several times you've um, used the phrase reputable source for soil. Could you tell us what is a reputable source for soil? So my reputable sor source for soil for me is my um, food waste composting, which, you know, I, I now have, uh -oh, maybe, maybe reputable, <laughs> so touch and go there. Um, but essentially I'm creating my own soil and I know that I have organic practices, you know, but sometimes your city mulch um, or leaf mulch group um, certainly a lot of the packaged materials, you know, when they've been tested, they have been found to be okay. Um, I mean, I think it's the truckload of something. You probably want to, you know, do some due diligence. And I, and I know Jess probably has some ideas of, you know, regional uh, people that, that the EPA has worked with. But I, I would say, you know, who are the composting organizations, the food waste organizations? You could be solving multiple problems in the same time that you're improving the soils. Yeah, and I, and I think it depends on the type of gardening that you want to do. Um, but the, the, the packaged soils are probably the easiest, um, but also the most expensive. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that starts to add up. Um, you know, the local um, community garden uh, and, and food organizations can often have organic composting uh, in Rhode Island, I know that that is actually ramping up. There is there is more and more composting available in the state. Um, I've I've gotten compost from Southside Community Land Trust before when I lived there. Um, you know, so I think that there's different ways of of getting that. If you don't do doing your own composting, it is great too. But that it is labor intensive and not for everybody. Um, but yeah, there, there's there's various ways of going about doing it. But you can do a little research. Um, and figure out, you want to make sure that it's organic and what does that mean? And, and I, I did have a truckload of soil delivered to me when I first established my bed and it was from an organic uh, you know, source that they do specifically for vegetable garden. It was their vegetable mix, organic compost <laughs> stuff. And, and, and that's what I got delivered, so. Okay. What about um, town compost? Um, lots of towns will um, offer free plant waste compost to residents. Do you, you probably can't say in every case. I, and, I, and I meant, I meant to, to, to do that little thing on stuff like, what are you using it for? It might not be the best source for a food garden. Okay, that's just what, yeah. because you don't know what pesticides potentially mm -hmm. have been sprayed onto the plant matter before it was brought in. Um, there have been certain contaminants found in municipal compost and, and some recent um, news stories that people might have seen um, that, you know, I, I, it, de it depends from municipality to municipality how it's, how it's handled, um, mm -hmm. but I, I would be hesitant for a food garden. And we're being very cautious here mm -hmm. um, because we're erring on the side of protecting you know, little growers who we want to encourage in the garden, mm -hmm. um, who are going to eat some soil while they're learning how to garden. So stop talking um, about my girls. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I, th I identified with that myself. So. <laughs> you know. <laughs> um, okay. Um, if you're concerned about your soil and you want to use raised beds, what is a sufficient depth for safe veggie growing, both leafy green and root types? So I think Jess might have already answered this, but I'll take a stab and we can, you know, circle back. So, you know, on your seed, um, and I, I don't know if they include this in the seed library, but certainly on your packets, it says what your root depth is. And so I will usually go with another couple inches below that and, and you know, map out where I'm growing what. You know, because it's not only what their root depth is, but who's going to shadow whom and where's this, you know, and so 
you know, make sure where you're growing your root crops. I mean, you saw the picture of the carrots. So, you know, you're, you're depending on the carrot variety, there are some that are very deep and there's some that are shorter, you know, a little bit more like a turnip than a carrot anymore. And so um, radishes too, the breakfast radish is much shorter than the bigger daikon. And so it really will be crop specific and soil specific, because sometimes the root crop is looking for a different kind of a condition than another kind of material. So, so I'd say, you know, plan it and then give yourself a little bit of wiggle room. Jess. Yeah, no, that's exactly, if it's not on the seed packet, look it up. I'm right. always, each springtime as I'm, I'm finding my new thing, I'm going to try and experiment with this year. Um, you know, looking at the root depth that it's needed, what condition, and then I have to decide what's going to be a container, what's going to take up one of my containers, what's going to go in the ground. Right, um, you know, exactly. So you, you, you know, this is getting to best practices just for gardening in general, no matter the contamination. You, you, you rotate crops, you know, there's, there's different types of soil that it's better for different things. Um, and, but, and and please don't stress, you know, no. if, if, if mapping all of that out is too much, given that we already have too much going on, um, grow above, put it in a container, relax, learn more, talk to people, mm -hmm. you know, decide to go back into the ground next year. Mm -hmm. So there's some great guidance on, on container gardening out there too. Um, you know, it doesn't have to be a fancy, you know, um, raised bed designed, you know, <laughs> beautiful wood thing. You can use whatever you've got that's a container that you can poke some holes in the bottom and, or line the bottom with some rocks and have some good drainage. So. so it is 7.30. We have about eight questions left. Or do, do you both have time to? Okay, great. So we'll go through. Um, soil testing here in Rhode Island. I, I think I know for a fact that you or I master gardeners will test soil. Um, Vanessa, I know you're out here. Um, if you put it in the chat, if, if that's not true anymore, but I believe that is true. So yeah, you or I. Um, so in Virginia, um, Don says he gets soil tests from Virginia Tech, but they do not test for lead. Their focus is on pH level and percentage of organic matter. What kind of testing do you recommend for lead, et cetera? So, um, I, so A, the one of the challenges is that a number of the land grant universities that used to do historical soil testing um, have gotten out of the business because it, mm -hmm. you know, there isn't demand. So one, even though they don't, I would say let's start creating demand. So start asking them for tests that they don't give because they won't even know that they've got to get back into the business until people start asking them for the services. Um, we were fortunate in this area. There was a, a University of District of Columbia, which is the only urban land grant university. They were trying to upgrade their lab, lab accreditation. And so they ended up doing free testing um, just so they could get the number of samples in and demonstrate the performance in the lab. So that might be something to find out are there labs that are trying to break into this area. Um, that might be an opportunity. Um, obviously, the land-grant universities that are offering the test, that's where you have to remember they're used to doing pH, NPK, maybe cation. It is usually a special separate request for metals or other kinds of, of very few of them are doing other kinds of contaminants. And it's an extra fee. And so that's, that's where we were talking about the different um, disciplines use the same language for a different, um, you know, term. Like so when we say testing, we're thinking contaminants. When you say testing to them, they're thinking plant and soil health. Can, um, yeah, and, and I would say it's great if URI is doing it. Um, it. In 2018, when we did the Providence one, it, they were not doing lead. They were doing soil testing, but it was for gardening. It wasn't, it was for garden health. And soil structure and pH and, and things like that, but not for lead. And so that's why we shared the the mass uh, UMass lab information. Um, but it's great if they are are now. Um, yeah, Vanessa actually just put in the chat um, that the master gardeners right now are only doing pH, but she recommends UMass and also yeah. UConn for yep. soil testing. Yep, so. exactly. Hey, U UConn stores is actually one of the uh, oldest um, agricultural labs in the country. Yep. 
Um, another thing, another organization to reach out to, um, and they've they've done some um, testing with, with urban agriculture, especially um, in New England, have, is the USDA Soil Conservation Service. Mm -hmm. um, they have um, the XRX, the X-ray uh, unit. Fluorescent that you analyzer. Saw. Yeah. yeah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> you use an acronym for so long, you forget what it stands for. Mm -hmm. um, so they, they can come up with their own equipment um, for, for certain types of, if they, if they, they might be looking to do some more outreach in their area. Um, and Summer Gonzalez is saying um, Southside Community Land Trust is actually testing soil for lead, um, free to residents on a limited basis. So yes, if it's actually with an EPA grant. Uh, oh, they, fantastic. Yeah, yeah. Full circle. <laughs> Full circle. <laughs> That's another thing. Environmental justice grants can sometimes mm -hmm. fund um, a nonprofit to, like they just did to the Southside Community Land Trust. If you have a large number of sites um, or a large number of residents or areas that you want to kind of try and, and, and get all uh, assessed and, and educated at the same time. Okay. So well, did only, you sorry, <laughs> only because only it gets widely spread around the universe, uh, the universe and I would like to um, cut the head off of this hydro, but I know that won't happen. Um, sunflowers do not remove oh. lead. Mm -hmm. Or as my colleague at Kansas State University said, well, maybe in about 400 years. So there are things that do some phytoremediation, lead not successfully. So despite what the web says, planting sunflowers will not remove your lead. Love a mm -hmm. sunflower. Not lead removal. <laughs> no. All, right. All right, so Dan asks, how many verified cases per year are there of heavy metal contamination um, that affect human health? Um, well, um, there are lots of occasions of lead poisoning, far too many in this country than we want to tolerate since it's preventable. Um, I think you can go to the CDC website because they are the ones that fund health departments to do that lead surveillance information. Mm -hmm. um, but again, that's a subset of probably the people that are experiencing health effects because not everybody is tested. And so, and there are um, surprisingly, people of uh, older ages, not just children under six, who get lead poisoned for a number of different reasons. Um, and so um, I can't put a number on it, but I suggest you go to the CDC um, and even in Rhode Island and Massachusetts. Yeah, there's, there's a couple good Rhode Island great links lead here. programs. Yep. Rhode Island has, a, has a, the Rhode Island Department of Health um, and then also the Rhode Island um, Renovation Repair and Painting Program. Um, and that's not all heavy metals, right? This is, they're focusing on lead. The lead is something that is most often sampled for and one of um, the, the highest risk we have, especially for younger people and, for younger and little kids. Yeah. yeah, but arsenic's, arsenic's a carcinogen. Arsenic's out I mean, there, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's, it's yeah. it, mercury. No, you don't want to be hanging out with that. You know, I mean, we could go, we can go through the periodic table go, and talk yeah. about it's, it's just, I think it's, it's, it's the prevalence of lead because it was in our paint. It was in our gasoline, <laughs> you know, it's, it's coming from our power plants and, and it's, you know, thing of atmospheric deposition coming down. Um, it's just one of the most widespread and something that there is no safe level for. And so you see more of effects of that and it's more closely tracked. I mean, and indicative part, of other things. The good part of being and the bad part of being the original colonies is you have an extra hundred years of lead than yeah, yeah. the rest of the country. <laughs> Sorry, but. Yeah. All right, so Miriam said that she just bought a house and it has some termite damage. They had an exterminator come in and they said they used Termidor and Taurus to get rid of the nests. Are these going to contaminate her soil? Are there alternatives to what a typical exterminating company offers to deal with infestations because they hope to have a garden in their yard. I am not the right person to ask that question, okay. but there are people um, who would have 
that information, um, both in the EPA Region 1 office and headquarters. And I would suggest you um, get that generic and whatever the chemical name is and look it up. It, if it's registered product, it should be, you should be able to see what the, the impacts are. Yes. And that, you know, we, we, as I said, we have a pesticide program and we sh you should be able to, to look up the information specific to that um, pesticide. Um, regardless, you know, in, again, you're treating your house. Um, you, you generally don't want to be planting a garden at the base of your house, regardless of pesticides. If it's an older home, you're going to have a long history of drip and contaminants and, and things coming um, from the, the building materials of the house. So um, further away from the house, the better. Um, and also, you know, you, the, the transportability or, of a pesticide is, is, you know, diminishes the further away from, from a house that you're going to get the most. Or, or, you know, also don't plant the garden where you scrape that window or you burn yeah. the trash or you did the car, the car repair or, you know, what about septic systems and their effect on the soil? Is that something that they could look up on your on the, on the EPA, EPA site as well? So generally septic systems are pretty deep, but I think, you know, kind of the septic operation is they don't generally want anything on top of the septic, be, right? So, mm -hmm. so I would say that's probably not your best bet location. And then yeah. you're dealing with, uh, you know, pa pathogens and, you know, other perk issues, pathogens, you know, other, other challenges. Yeah, I, I would say it's, it's more structural and pathogen related than contaminant. Right. Okay. Just a couple more questions. Um, are there regulations that control soil safety? Like, how do we know that our soil source is a safe soil when we purchase it? So there are some environmental regulations. Um, I know I've, you know, I've seen material um, classifications for fill or how certain kinds of soils can and can't be used, what standards they have to meet. Sometimes that's an environmental organization or regulatory agency. Sometimes it's actually an agricultural regulatory agency. I can't speak specifically to Rhode Island. I maybe maybe Jess has some um, information for you. Yeah, I mean, I think that I, I was going along with the question until it said the, the packaged soil. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, so there's standards for soil contamination in the ground for site reuse, and and that is something that you could you know, reach out to Red Island DEM about. Um, the standard for packaged soil, I don't know, because I think that would be more commercial. It would be commercial regulations um, for, for sold, you know. Um, so I, I, I don't know. I, I'm not aware of anything specific. Um, I think a lot of it is kind of like how you, you can try and make a judgment about the, um, the company that you're buying from and their practices. Um, you know, and I think that's why you see so many different certification company certifications out there. It's like, no, we really are reliable. We, you know, um, you know, oh, what was it? A certified B corporation is, is the big thing now, or, uh, you know, whatever it is. So you just, you try and do your homework, but at the end of the day, you make an informed decision. It's not the perfect decision. You make the best informed decision you can but we don't want this to be, you, never, you end up not gardening or ever leaving your house again. <laughs> you know, it, it's going to be okay. We're trying to make better decisions. Right. And as good gardeners, we know that we're improving our soil and yeah. top dressing it every fall and every mm -hmm. spring. And so, you know, this isn't a one and done, you know, activity. <laughs> we're, yeah. we're in it for the long haul. And those will be improving the soil, improving the soil structure, you know, testing over time, improving and making it a great place to grow over time. Is packaged mulch a good top dressing material? Or like pathways and like 
run the base of a house or top dressing for like in amongst your 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 garden as an organic matter so um i i they didn't say specifically in the question yeah i mean i mean i, I think packaged mulch is fine for pathways and you know you want to get organic mulch if you could because you don't want things running off from mm -hmm. there's some of the mulch is treated mm -hmm. right um so you if you're in a edible vegetable garden scenario um, you generally want to be organic mulch. You can mulch around your pathways, around the edge of the garden, um, top cover within a garden. Um, you know, there, there's different things that you could put in there, I think, that are probably better choices than mulch necessarily. Um, you know, uh, responsibly, you know, sourced hay or um, just more compost. You add, you know, cover over time, you can add a, um, you know, you can have one of the, the barriers over the top for weeds and things like that, that will also keep um, soil down. That's kind of what I use in my garden. It's just, I, I just put over um, just the weed barrier, one of the organic weed barriers, and it keeps the weeds out and the soil down underneath. So Vanessa Venturini from the Master Gardener said she's uh, so, glad, uh, so glad to see the EPA encouraging urban agriculture. When should they refer people your way through the URI Master Gardener program? Are you actively working with um, urban gardeners or are there resources, I guess, through the EPA that urban gardeners can access? I think some of the, you know, a good starting point is just some of these um, materials that are summarized here, mm -hmm. um, just for, for baseline knowledge, get people reading up, um, educating themselves. If there's something here that they could use more information on, on how to exactly, I'm always happy to try and troubleshoot right. specific things, but it does, it gets to be a capacity yeah. <laughs> issue, right? Um, right. I, I wish I wish there are many more ants in the world, and <laughs> uh, you know, but there are only so many of us in, uh, around who who are kind of the urban ag uh, and, and leads, you know, for for our program. So, but but um, again, I think it's like talk to because we have brownfield colleagues in different, you know, city, county, local, mm -hmm. and so. Yeah. A, some of the people that have worked on those projects will be helpful and can be helpful. I also think cities need to understand because community gardens, urban ag has been sort of an afterthought activity, not that, no, no, we want this to be a type of land use that is supported and structured and planned for. And that requires, again, a little bit of, you know, citizenry clamor, you know, which is we got to ask for it. And, 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 and in Rhode Island, you guys are lot. really lucky that this, this, it is that the food aspect of Rhode Island is so strong and, and so is the agriculture. And, and I do think that there's a lot of support. And that's one thing, you know, we can always make connections. Um, I, and I guess I should back up to always pour them our way. I'll, I'll always try and make a connection. If I can't make, if I can't help personally, I'll try and find someone else who can. Um, I'm always happy to help uh, on the subject. Okay. I apparently we have somebody from Region Three who really wants to know: Are we going to do this for Region Three, Jess? So we might have to oh. do a re, a re <laughs> Maybe maybe we can get this as a rolling uh, thing across the country, and we can bring our, our regional colleagues we'll along. Sure. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, on behalf of Fatima and Lee and myself, thank you, Jessica and Anne. This was it was such a comprehensive presentation. You are wonderful. You make it so palatable. Um, for everyone listening. Thank you to our collaborators. And most of all, thank you to everyone who joined us tonight. Our next program in the Seedling Series is on Thursday, January 27th on Zoom at 6.30 p.m. Our presenter is Summer Gonzalez, an environmental scientist, co-leader of the Brown University Superfund Community Engagement Corps and member of the Narragansett Indian Tribe, who will be talking to us about food justice and soil remediation. Uh, together, we'll discuss inequities in the current food system that harm both consumers and food producers, while imagining what a food just system would look like for all people everywhere.
So please join us if you can. Uh, Lee is putting the registration at provcomlib.org link in the, um, the chat. And remember, if you miss a program or would like to watch a second time, the recorded programs will be available some point in the soon near future. Don't go looking for it tomorrow morning <laughs> on our um, YouTube channel. And that link is also in the chat. So thank you all so, so much and um, take care everybody.